My name's Mike Rowe, and this is my job. I explore the country looking for people who aren't afraid to get dirty. The rock is fake. The penguin poo is real. Hard-working men and women who earn an honest living. Is this a real job? It is. I don't it really it is. is. Doing the kinds of jobs that make civilized life possible for the rest of us. Now, get ready. Oh, oh dear. To get dirty. Coming up on Dirty Jobs. I'm 70% dirty. From the outside, it's a massive wall of steel that protects this harbor from hurricanes. It's a little more complicated than I thought. But inside... A nightmare. It's a muck-filled maze of rusty little rooms. Sludge dripping. In need of a spring cleaning. Hard hats. Excellent idea down here. And then... To make wedding bells ring, the magic ingredient is... Yeah, it's horse poop. And I'm up to my elbows in the stuff as I learned that these bell makers have very high standards. You're going to get the impurities out of the poo. Yeah. The poo jokes, they never get old, do they? Oh, they do? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Out there beyond the point is Long Island Sound. This protected area is Stamford Harbor, and behind me is the town of Stamford. Oh, and this thing? That's a hurricane barrier. Every couple years it has to be pulled out of the water so the Army Corps of Engineers can perform some routine maintenance. It's about that time. During tropical storms or hurricanes, the barrier protects the city of Stamford from high tides that could cause flooding. It took two years to build this massive wall of steel. They started in 1968 and finished in 1970. The structure is 35 feet tall, 90 feet across, and 4 feet wide. I didn't really get a whole lot of information before I came here, but obviously it's a little more complicated than I thought. The Army divers are all getting geared up to obviously go in the water. I'm not going in the water today. I'm supposed to be going inside of the barrier itself, which at first glance is off-putting because it's not like that. Well, this is Diana. Diana works for the Army Corps of Engineers. At the moment, she's uh, applying some duct tape to my boot and fancy yellow suit, which can't be a good sign. Steve, this isn't a good sign, is it? No, Mike, it's not a good sign. All right, uh, we're standing on top of a, uh, of a hurricane barrier. That's correct. And is this essentially separating the harbor here in Stamford? How does it work? It is. Uh, during periods of high tides and coastal storms, we raise the uh, barrier here. Yeah. Uh, normally, it's on the ocean floor. Boats pass right over it. Uh, during tidal surges, we'll raise the gate, and we protect about 600 acres inside the harbor. Got it. So when this barrier is up, like it is right now, people on boats, they can't get in and out of the harbor. That's correct. Uh, for this uh, event here, we have uh, press releases. We notify the marinas, Coast Guard. Um, everyone should know. Uh, you do that guy you doesn't. No, he, he doesn't, and he'll probably be upset about it. Ah, well, you know, life is full of pain and disappointment. We have two halves of the gate. One half is getting worked on right now. We're going to be washing it out, changing uh, zinc anodes. Uh, the banging is part of the uh, anodes that are getting changed. Now, when you say zinc anodes, is that are they, these things down here? That's, that's exactly it. I'm not sure I really understand. Talk to me as though I were a, a, a small, stupid child. Zinc anodes are covering in the hundreds this hurricane barrier. That's correct. There is, there is approximately 550 uh, zinc anodes. These anodes emit a small charge, which uh, the corrosion essentially attacks the zinc instead of attacking the gate right. and rusting the gate out. So a charge created by a zinc anode protects this metal from erosion. That's correct. All right. Look, I'm just kind of pretending I understand everything that's happening, and I, I kind of do. Uh, we've already monitored uh, oxygen and uh, hydrogen sulfide levels were all right. There's fresh air theoretically in there. Uh, we'll have a meter with us just in case. Gotcha. And the gases you're worried about could result from the mud and the stuff. Exactly. And the, sediment. The, hydrogen, the hydrogen sulfide is from the, the sediment and everything we're going to be kicking up. Um, O2 levels. Uh, from us being down there just breathing oxygen, we're going to create a, a CO level, and uh, that could you know, be dangerous for us. How far down is that? 
If you were to slip and fall? 20 feet, 25 feet. Well, that's not slip and fall. Ladies first? Oh, gentlemen. So the job is to identify zinc anodes in need of repair and replace them. Sounds simple, if you don't mind getting lost in the labyrinth of chambers, if you don't mind getting wet, and if you don't mind walking through the dark. Diana? Oh, Diana? Diana got this unusual job by becoming a park ranger with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Imagine, she actually gets paid to work in this beautiful setting. Where in the heck am I? Yep, park ranger. Are you down there? A dirty job. Yeah. There you are. <sighs> oh, it stinks in here, Diana. You know that, don't you? Yes. Of course you do. So all these little uh, square containers are full of this. Yep. That's sediment, <clears throat> decayed. <sighs> That's Fish. terrible. No, it kind of smells like rotten eggs. Rotten eggs, sulfur, exactly. We have to wash hose down, all the sediment, try to kick it out. Kick it where? See these little holes right there? Oh, yeah. You want to push it out there so it goes down to the main level that you just, the manhole that you went down, so, went down. So we're pushing sediment from the top toward the bottom. Yeah. Everything's falling toward the bottom. Mm -hmm. So it just gets worse and worse the further down you go. Yeah. Diana's going east right now to get in the, uh, the furthest cubicle on the east side, and we're going to work our way in a, uh, in a westerly direction. You need some more slack? Yeah. Can we pull some more slack? Yeah. Uh, you didn't watch how I went in? I didn't. I didn't want to be rude. I felt like I was staring. In each of these compartments, there's six anodes. One on the ceiling, one on the floor, and one on each of the four walls. And that's east, so this is north? No, that's going to be top. No, top. Top, bottom, east, west, north, south. North. North? Oh, crap. Now, how do you know when one of these anodes is ready to be replaced? Is you that... have to do an estimate. You kind of look at the percentage of what you think is left. So you look, and you know how you saw the whole one that you're holding. Yeah. That was 100. Yeah. So if that's 100%, I'd say this is something like, uh, I don't know, 75? Yeah. That 80%, sounds good. something like yeah. that? So when do you replace them? Below 50. Below 50. All right. The anodes are covered with the muck from the bottom of the harbor. Our job is to wash them off so we can see how much of the anode is left. Oyster? Looks like it. It's not uncommon to find eels, fish, and other sea life living in the sediment. is 80% and west is 75% over. Communication and sense of direction are key. Probably could have thought that one through a little better. I feel soaking wet. How did this happen? Is the back of my pants torn? <laughs> no. Thanks for checking though, it's confirming. Did you say the back of my pants are 70% corroded? Dirty, not corroded. <laughs> I'm 70% dirty. Coming up, crawling around in a hurricane barrier. You're bound to learn a life lesson. There's always a hole, and everything always goes down to the next level. Everything goes down, including me. <laughs> and then, church bells the dirty little secret. There's horse poo in bells. Yes, we do things the old way, the way it's always been. It's amazing. Uh oh, it's old fashioned. So that yellow tube that you see coming down there is basically pumping oxygen into the lower levels, so we don't, so we don't die. And if you, if you look beyond it, you just see. Basically cube after cube after cube, A all the way through P, so it's like 17 letters. People scream and yell back and forth all the time, everybody shouting out commands, just constant communication, constant water, air pumping, sludge dripping. A nightmare. 
This is a huge team effort. There are multiple crews above me, below me, to the side of me, on the wall, under the wall, pretty much everywhere. And they're all doing the same thing, replacing the zinc anodes. It's got to be done by sundown, and I think I'm slowing them down. Fortunately, I'm part of a team. If you're wondering about the climate inside a hurricane barrier, it's balmy, which makes me wonder, why can you see my breath? So, we're still on the third level. Now we're, where am I? In a cube what? Uh, you're an M. M. Yep. All right, and more of the same. More of the same, you can see the, the sediment is built up against this wall. Yeah. This is the wall that, when the gate's in the open position, that's essentially the floor. So right. all our sediment and everything rests up against that side. Yeah, just uh, dilute it and try and push it down the hole. There's always a hole, and everything always goes down to the next level. Some other lucky soul can deal with it. The hard hats, excellent idea down here. 90, got a little corrosion through here. The, the minute we're done and we put the gate down, it's all gonna come back in. 70%. Five percent. Of course, we have to go down. down there. Yep. I'm just going down to level four to push out the muck and sediment, and uh, you know, basically gauge the integrity of a series of anodes. I'll be down here. You. you again. Yes, me again. Another level. Another cube. Yep. Another problem? That the problem is that's all jammed up in the corner and that's why we've got this huge blockage in here. Yeah, there might be some blockage on that side too that we might have to climb in. We'll have to try it here first. <laughs> why is the water just not rushing out? <laughs> yeah, dirty girl. You sure you don't want to try this? I'm pretty sure. <laughs> With Diane's dainty little feminine foot, she, she's able to get in there. And now, oh, oh, there you go. Um, isn't it just going to fill up this compartment now? Yeah. Something just swam into my foot. I'm going to take this fish, and I'm going to put him in the only place on the hurricane barrier where he's got a chance, the lower level. No guarantees, but this is your best hope. Good luck, little fella. Sea creatures often get inside the hurricane barrier. Oh, a brown starfish. That can't be good. Because most of the time, the barrier is resting on the sea floor with its hatches wide open, letting in water. This keeps the wall from floating to the surface. You know, what else do we have to do before we can get out? After we check all the anodes and before we change them, we just want to get a sample. A sample of what? The beautiful monkey you love so much. If I'm not back in five minutes, call Fish and Wildlife or whoever you are for. Coming up, they say there's nine levels of hell, but in a hurricane barrier, there's only six. Hello, level six. So, things could be worse, but not by much. I'm standing in sediment, mud, and I don't even know what else. And then, well, this is insanely hot up here. Learn the secret ingredient to make an old-fashioned bell. We do things the old way, the way it's always been. And later, accompany me to the luxurious penthouse where the bells live. I'm not a doctor or anything, but I, I believe this is a breeding ground of contagion and risk. Home sweet home. OK, that's level five. One down is level six. Yep. Tell me it's safe. By the meter, no alarms, everything looks good. Everything looks great. You're just gonna get a little wet. Yeah. Level six hasn't been cleaned in nearly 40 years. Just make it quick. Yeah. Everything we push down the man waves ends up down there. And I've gotta get a sample of it. <sighs> level five? So long, level five. 
Hello, level six. I'm standing in sediment, mud, and I don't even know what else. And I'm going... Ugh. <laughs> Ugh. Is this enough? Yeah. Great. I've been to the sixth level. Impressive. I didn't like it. I don't even go down there. This is 40 year old mud, more or less. It is. That's, yeah. that's right. The key to it is that we're going to find out what's in here so that we can dispose of it properly. Because if it's very dangerous, then it's got to be put in a special place. Exactly. And, and that requires budgeting, which will be a few years out. Um, so if we know now how much it's going to cost to dispose of it, we can... Well, do me a favor. Call me if you find out there's anything toxic in there, because if I'm not mistaken, I just <clears throat> stuck my arm in there up to my neck. Let me just try and sum up, and correct me if I'm wrong, but zinc throws off a small electrical charge. That electrical charge attracts the corrosive elements in the salt water, the salt, to it, thereby extending the life of the concrete and steel barrier that's now pushing 40. Well said. Exactly. See, finally... After nine hours down in a little slice of heaven, it's all starting to make sense. Well, let me at least do one so I can say, if nothing else, that I'm an anoid changer on a hurricane barrier? Exactly. North wall, level three, apartment M. Oh, she's a beaut. Oh, yeah. Well, this is the first bit of good news I've seen all day. Okay. You got it. Good. Belmont Adams. Nice work. Thanks. That should last us about five years. Well, do me a favor. In five years, when it's time to do it again, we'll think of you. Think of me all you want. Just don't call me. Inside a hurricane barrier. Cross that one off the list. Well, at the end of the day, it took a team of professional scuba divers and half a dozen rangers from the Army Corps of Engineers to remove 80 zinc anodes from a 40-year-old hurricane barrier here in beautiful Stamford, Connecticut. I did this one. Coming up. Uh-oh. To make a bell with a beautiful, pure sound, it takes molten Good. metal. Whoa. A bunch of elbow grease. I'm polishing a bell. And a little horse poop. When does the horse poop become involved? From the beginning. It'll all make sense when I get to the McShane Bell Foundry next. In 1856, Henry McShane left the shores of Ireland, headed for the United States of America. He wound up in Dundalk, Maryland, and started making bells. Today, Henry McShane is dead and gone, but his bells... His bells are alive and well, and so too is his legacy. Today, the guys at the McShane Bell Foundry are still doing things the old-fashioned way, with sand and sweat and fire, and one other little goodie. Yeah, it's horse poo. This is Bill. Bill, what's up with the horse poo? Uh, it's used as a binder in the sand to uh, keep the sand together so when we pour the hot metal in, it won't wash away. Gotcha. Now, Bill Parker, this has been in your family now for, for how long? 1935. 1935. And this is Dan? Yes. All right, and uh, Dan is standing in front of what? It's an oil burning furnace. It's got a ceramic crucible in it. We loaded it up with bronze. This is the bronze? Thing. This is the bronze. Silicon so, bronze. So, Bill, tell me, I mean, 
What exactly am I going to see today? Is it going to be dirty? It's going to be dirty. It's what you're going to be doing. You're going to be loading the blast furnace with brass ingots, yeah. with bronze, and then after we get them set in place, we're going to get you to fire the furnaces up, and then we're going to wait till the metal melts, and then you're going to be pouring a bell. When does the horse poo become involved? From the beginning, when we set the molds up, we use fire sand, three parts fire sand, and one part horse manure, that's the binder, and you keep making layers on the mold until it comes up until you get the exact form. I just want to understand that, you know, the old-fashioned way of making bells is there's, there's horse poo in bells. Yes. In other words, there's a lot of synthetic binders you could use today, but it would take away from the history of our company. We, we do things the old way, the way it's always been. It's amazing. Hey, what happened to the Liberty Bell, anyway? Well, if McShane would have made it, they'd have been ringing it today. <laughs> okay. So it's just so I'm clear, <clears throat> nomenclature-wise, ingot? Ingot. Crucible. Crucible. Ingot goes in the crucible, and how hot will this burn? Uh, we're going to pour it around 2,000 degrees. 2,000 degrees of molten Molten. Bronze. The metal will be about 2,000. The furnace is going to be actually much hotter than that. All right, so what do we just drop them in? No, don't drop them. The crucible is made out of a ceramic material. It's kind of like a glass material. You have to set the ingots in. If you drop them into the bottom, you'll punch a hole right through the bottom of the crucible. That so what you want to do is lower them down until you're actually setting them on the bottom. All right. It's like a, uh, like a campfire. Exactly. 3,000 degree campfire. So I guess we're about ready to light it up. I'm going to turn the, turn the fan on right now. All right. Fashion. Well, that's on. Let's just say, understand how this is working. I believe that the air is being forced straight through there. That's correct. The air is blowing through, picking up the fuel and moving it in. So the so the air is pushing the oil. Exactly. So how long does it take to uh, percolate? You can see the pot's starting to get red now. Yeah. In about an hour, the metal should be pretty well melted. All right, well, what do you want to do for the next hour? Uh, best thing is to go over to my son, Bill Parker, Jr., and uh, meet with him, and he's going to show you about the looming making of the uh, church bell itself. Is this where the horse poop comes in? That's where it comes in. Should I take it with me? Yeah, I take it with you. <laughs> All right. I'm taking a bag of horse poop to meet a third-generation bell maker. I think he's third. Are you a are, are you a junior or the third? I'm the third generation. William Parker's been making bells. Bill Parker the third. It's you nice to officially meet you. Uh, you're throwing dirt on the floor just to make a little mess. Yeah. This is par for the course. This, this is par for the course. This is what we call our fire sand. It's a high temperature sand that we use with our molds. Where do you get it? Get it up from a quarry up in New Jersey. It's a high temperature, so it can resist the temperatures of the metal. Sand from a quarry in New Jersey. And this is poo from a horse's ass. That's true. That's what that's the binder in our mold mixture. Three right. parts sand, one part horse manure, which we have to sift to get all the impurities out. There we go. That's probably enough to start with. Right. And all we do is just take your hand with the, and just rake it across the screen. And what it does, it takes the manure and it just softens it up and pushes it right through. And it see all the uh, we're left with all the straw, which is not what we want in a mold. Yeah, I guess that we don't would be want no bad, impurities right? in this. No, it's got to be fresh and pure. This is pure poo. This is the purest poo you're ever going to see. When we're done with this, this is poo you could eat off of. I may be overstating it. That's going to put a little much. Well, there's something. I mean, the sound of a bell, you know, peeling across the landscape as the fog comes in off of the moors. I mean, it's, you know, it's epic. It is. It is. I mean, they use it for signaling. They use it for calling to worship. And they use it for a ton of things. Can't get enough of that thing. Yeah, you will by the end of the day. Oh, I think we just about got everything. So what we're gonna do, this is our binder, and so we already got a three-part sand in there. So what we're gonna do is take this, throw it in the sand, and we're just gonna mix up the sand, and we'll just water it down to get it to like a mud pot consistently so we can pack it in around the mold. And that happens on the floor? Happens right on the floor. <laughs> this formula was first concocted by Henry McShane when he started the company back in 1856. Two parts sand, one part poo. Making a bell. McShane noticed that the horse poo he saw on the streets of Baltimore acted like an organic glue. All right, so, bucket's full, now where? Now we're ready to take it down to the mold. Down to the mold, which, fortunately, is not that far down. All right, what we're going to do is we're going to take everything by hand, and we're going to start packing it in. Feel how there's little points in here? Yeah. That's what the sand grabs a hold of. But we also want to push it through these holes when we smack it in. It'll come through the outside, and that's what makes the sand 
adhere to the mold. You're like making a, uh, we're making a negative. Sort of like Man. making a negative. This is what makes the outside of your bell. This is the quote. Well, all the bells up there, they, they all have holes in them. Holes in them. This is what they call the cages. Cages. Cages, yes. This is the coat, and behind you is the core. This makes your outside of your bell, that makes the inside of the bell. The inside of the cage is the coat. Right. Got it. Little balls of the sand and horse poo mixture are hand packed into the mold until it starts to come out. This thing is going to swing around, isn't it? This thing's going to make a rotation around, and it's going to start to cut and form the shape of the bell. Gives the lines on the bell that are distinctive from exchange, and it's just going to carve everything through. Right. What do you call this part of the uh, thing? It's called a sweep. A sweep, yeah. You can kind of look upside down. It's an upside down bell. It's got the curves of the bell that go all the way down and make the head. Right. Same sweeps that we have up here on the wall. These are all original. How many bells have those sweeps made? Thousands upon thousands. That's what I'm saying. I mean, that's basically your business, right? That is my business. If we lose them, we lose everything. That's our show. There you go. <laughs> the food jokes, they never get old, do they? Oh, they do? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so are we kind of done? We're done with this right now. We're going to bake it so it dries. Right. Right now, we're going to check the temperature on our furnace. Coming up, bells are born with horse manure and polished up with toilet paper. As I get ready to pour some molten metal, things at the bell factory get hot and heavy. I, I feel the heat in a place where a man doesn't want to feel that kind of heat. And later. I can talk like this all day, but I won't because it's foolish and silly. At the top of this bell tower, there's no maid service. Holy cow. Oh, dude. At this stage of the bell making process, the bronze is heated to over 2,000 degrees so that the molten metal can be poured into the mold. A high tech thermometer is put into the crucible to measure the temperature. It's hot. 2,000 degrees, hot enough to pour. I want you to stand up here on the forks and you have to keep yeah. your shield down. Bill, this is insanely hot up here. Extremely. Insanely hot. What you want to do, don't pull it to the front, you want to push it to the back. Push the slag to Push the back. Push the slag to the back. Gotcha. Just like that. See how clean it is? Yep. I feel the heat in a place where a man doesn't want to feel that kind of heat. Don't be a baby. Okay? Go around the edges and keep pushing it back. <laughs> All right, you're done. Carefully take it out. OK. Good. All right. Yeah. Step down here. Yeah. And when you pour, it's going to start coming out. Just guide it slow. He's going to move forward. All right. Keep your legs behind here. In case it spills on the floor, it's going to spill out this way. Gotcha. So I'm ready? slowly coming forward? Slowly coming forward. Okay. Here we go. A little bit faster. Faster? A little bit faster. Okay, a little bit faster. You sure? That's good. Down a little bit. Keep going a little bit faster. That's good. Yep. Keep going. Now we're making a bell. Good. It's almost full. Top over here. A little bit more. Oh, getting full. There you go. Really Start close. It Spin it back. There you go. That's your first bill. <laughs> perfect. Good job, Mike. Good? Perfect, yeah. See, she's up in the riser. Everything else is good. That's what you want to see. So inside of there is a, a smaller version of what we just did exactly. turned right side up. Right side up. Correct. 60 pound bell. Cool. Doesn't look like much now, but that's 2,000 degrees of liquid bronze, and it's hardening as we speak. And inside of this mold, a bell is being formed. You have to start out with a clean pot each day, and if you don't clean it when it's hot, then you're going to have to start it back up again before we put metal in it. Right. To get always, it hot. always clean your pot. Always clean your pot. Just so flipping hot. It doesn't need to be perfect. Just get the big stuff out. You know what these are? These are gardening gloves. They're not, they're not sufficient. Gloves. You got big, fancy, grown-up gloves. Now, see, this is a proper set of gloves. These, I don't know. Here you go, Dan. Go pull some weeds. All right. What happens if you want to work in a foundry what? Don't be a baby. Don't be a baby. So on any given day, there are any given number of bells here at McShane in any given state of completion, I guess, right? Yes. This is Ryan, by the way. You are the, the youngest, Parker? Yes, I am. Okay. Yes, I am. And uh, do you have a specific job here at the foundry, or just pretty much everybody seems to do everything? Yeah, it's pretty much everybody kind of handles a little bit of everything. One of my basic jobs here is uh, making sure the bells are clean properly. Yeah. So, yeah. so you do restoration as well, because like Bill said, these, these bells can last for basically an eternity. 
as long as they're maintained. They will outlast us, for sure. Where, where have these monsters come from? Uh, these ones right here, I believe, are from Minnesota. A lot of times, these churches, they've had these bells in their towers for, you know, decades and decades. Right. They turn the green. It's called yeah. patina. It's very toxic. So when they bring them in here, we're going to refurbish them. We take them, we have them sandblasted. And then the next step, we have three cleaning pads we use on them. We've got a coarse pad, a medium pad, and a fine pad. Right. So basically, it goes from the sandblasting after that to the finished product right there. And then after we polish it, it starts to look like that, or maybe even better. Yeah, even better. You'll be able to see yourself in it when we're done. At a cost of $22,000, this 1,288-pound bronze bell took three months to make. Still, Ryan's trusting me with the final step of the process. He must have never seen our show. Oh, How looks great. Looks great. Yeah? Beautiful. Great job. One more step. One more yeah. step. That's where the polishing comes in. This is what we're going to polish the bell with. What is it exactly? It's pretty much just a rubbing compound we use. Um, we actually get it from an automotive store, actually. You want to tilt it a little bit here and there and move it up and down. I'm polishing a bell. Oh, it looks awesome, Mike. It looks awesome. Yeah? Good job. All right. This is the stuff that comes off of it, by the way. Just so you know. Cleaning a bell. Sturdy job. Who knew? Bells are born with horse manure and polished up with toilet paper. There's a certain symmetry to that, I suppose. As to where they'll spend the rest of their lives, that's another story. What well, looks like a likely place for a bell? What are we looking at there, Bill? Hi, we're looking at Holy Cross Catholic Church. Yeah. We've got about five of McShane bells up in there. How long have they been up there? I think 1891. Long time. It's unbelievable. All right, so when you make a product that lasts for the ages, I suppose the, uh, the maintenance is pretty much ongoing? Pretty much ongoing. We try to get every, every customer we have on a maintenance contract, and we come out here once a year and take care of it. And this basically is your, uh, is your tool belt? That's my tool belt right there. What are we going to do up there to these 100-year-old bells? Actually, we're not going to really work on the bells themselves. We're going to work on the mechanisms that ring the bells. Take them apart, grease them, make sure they're working properly, and put them back together. We're going to grease gonna stuff up? Bells. We're going to grease some stuff up. We're going into a church to grease stuff up. There's a sentence I bet nobody's ever heard before. I don't even know what that means. It's a good thing. Coming up, have you ever seen a bell disrespected like this before? What kind of a dingaling would stick his head inside a bell? <laughs> this kind of dingaling. Today I've come to the Holy Cross Catholic Church to do some maintenance work on some really old bells. The job didn't sound too bad, really. You all right? <laughs> Never better. Until I got to the six flights of really steep stairs, which led me to the luxury penthouse where the bells live. <laughs> it's a little Holy bit of a mess cow. up here. Oh, dude. Somebody let the windows open a little bit. What the heck? These are pigeons. Well, uh, devils. Oh, I've seen this before. This is pigeon poo. And a lot of it. Yeah, sometimes I get into the tower and it can make an incredible mess. Well, well they're dead ones. The uh, ones that made it in didn't make it out. I'm not, I'm not a doctor or anything, but I, I believe this is a breeding ground of contagion and risk. Sometimes you run into this on certain projects. You want one? Or are you immune to it at this point? Probably immune to it at this point. No, I remember reading stuff. Histoplasmosis, mm -hmm. stereosis, all a bunch of osis. All right. Take a tool to take a murder right here. <laughs> I mean, I, have you ever seen a bell disrespected like this before? <laughs> Doesn't it chap your butt? I mean, this is a McShane bell. It's a work of art. I think of all the craftsmanship and time that went into it just to be violated by a bunch of random avian. Sickens me. All right, well, I've delayed long enough. I will now assume a recumbent position in the poo and the dead pigeon bodies. I can now feel the contagion of Lots and lots of toxic stuff seeping through my skin. 
Just tell me what I'm looking at right now. I mean, most people would expect to see the clapper hanging, but what is this thing? This is what we call a stationary strike unit. What this does, it simulates a swinging bell, swinging back and forth, but the bell has been affixed. So it's got an electromagnetic clapper up underneath there that strikes the bell from the inside. So a, a signal emanates from down there somewhere. Yeah, they throw a switch or it comes on from the clock and then it'll uh, simulate swinging back and forth. So is it this thing that looks like the thing that sits in your toilet that actually hits the bell? Yeah, it's called the clapper balls. That's the clapper balls? Clapper ball. Ball. Clapper ball. Just yep. the one ball. Just the one ball. Well, one ball sometimes enough to do the job. <sighs> I'm in a bell. I'm in a 120-year-old bell. In 20-year-old poo. Oh. Okay, now I can work. Huh. And okay, now you got a kind of room up here. Yeah, now I got room. Okay, now I can now I can see sort of. Yeah. So what we're gonna do is just squeeze these two cotter pins together on both sides. Right? And pull them out. Yeah, Wait a minute. Oh, I together. can pull that now. There you go. Okay. All right. Just put it to the side. And then we just push that back through. Same principle. Same principle. There you ah. go. Good job. All right. The cotter pin holding the uh, electronic uh, clapper. Yep. Underneath the 120-year-old belt. Okay. And this is where the heavy part is. You gotta grab this and just pull it right to you. Just watch this angle here. It slides right off. Right. Okay. There you go. Oh. <laughs> That'll make you go deaf in a few minutes. Oh my god, all right. So this is this is heavy. It's pretty heavy, yeah. It needs to be the proper size for the right size bell. Oh man, this thing really gets going. This bell's be loud, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, if you have a small clapper on a bell this size, you'll never hear it. So it's gotta be the right size for the right size bell. Proper if you have a small weird. clapper, forget about it, guys. The big bell needs a big clapper. So basically what you're gonna do is take this tube of grease, rub it along the uh, shaft. Yeah. <laughs> like so? Yep, that's it. Uh, you see that's got some weight to it? Yep. That's gonna go in there. Just let it rest on this and let it slide down, and then you can just. Okay. There you go. All right. Now you gotta put your pin back through the other way. You want to pull this down first? This one or this one? Uh, you can pull it down. You can do either one. A little on the tough side. Rookie mistake. <laughs> That's true. Are you talking? Because I can't hear anything. All I hear is. <laughs> so somebody flips a switch, and essentially. The charge hits the solenoid? Hits the solenoid, it gets magnetic, and it pulls the plunger down through. So this plunger's sitting here. When this falls, like that, it drags this bar. And when this bar comes down, you basically have a bell that rings. This is going to go through here. If I recall, it's going to go up uh, down this way. I like the way I sound up here in the bell. It's a good echo. I like it up here in the bell. But I like the way I sound, Bill. I sound like a full-grown man with his head in a bell. I can talk like this all day. But I won't, because it's foolish and silly. I just spit a little toward the lens. Did you see that? Everything hurts, Bill. What's that? I said everything hurts. Oh, it's been a rough day. It's done pretty good for you first day, though. Yeah. I've got bigger plans for you tomorrow. I might have cut class the day they told you how to open a cotter pin. Yeah. It's kind of... Grab it. Uh -huh. Just use the leverage of where the pin's at. And oh, just it back. There you go, right oh, there. Yeah, an absolute idiot could have done that. Mm. I didn't think it through, though. Oh. I hear bells. It's one of my jobs there. That's a McShane bell ringing across town? That is Star of the Sea, about uh, <clears throat> four blocks away. What is it, Star of the what? <clears throat> Star of the Sea. What's that? Is that a church? Uh -oh. Yeah. Six o'clock. Couple seconds, it's gonna get even louder, Mike. Are you kidding me? Oh, uh, just hold your ears. I told you guys to tell me when it was six o'clock. That's insane. Don't tell me that. It's six o'clock around here. Bell ringers start. To...
Hey, Mike, who rings the bell 14 times? It's the call of the angels. It's a prayer call of worship. It goes off at 6, 12, and 6 every day. Oh, I'm sorry. That was a prayer? Catholic Church, yeah. Uh, we need a few seconds here. Will that be it? That's it. I may have cursed a prayer. Who would you tell me when 6 o'clock was coming? I don't have my watch on today. The prayer of who? Prayer of Angelis? Yep, the Angelus prayer for Catholic churches. They have it uh, three times a day. 14 rings? Yep. Well, I mean, we heard the bell ringing across town. That could have been a cue. I was just happy to hear my bell ring. I just didn't pay attention. Sorry about that. That could, I mean, a lot of people would have looked at that as a warning that the bell the man was sitting in was about to go off. That was next. I do. I got to tell you, I, uh, I, I can't feel anything from my knees down. My legs are completely asleep. My ears are ringing like a, like a bell. Um... Look at that. You did it. One hand. You did it without even looking with one hand. That was a bit of a show off. Sorry about that. So, to my untrained eye, I believe we've uh, just made a repair. We've serviced the system. It's good for another year now. At this point, I'd just like to get out of the bell if it's possible. That way. Gosh, if only my legs worked. <laughs> that would be grand. So Here we are. Yep, these are the switches. This is the, uh, the modern-day equivalent of a, of a guy with a rope and a hump. That's right. All we now flip a switch to uh, hear what we just fixed. These guys here. Yep. The ones above it. These guys here. People are wondering what the world's going on. Yeah. What's up over at Holy Cross? <laughs> you know, in moments like these, I think... Uh, I think of Troy, my cameraman. I wonder how he's doing. He's probably up in the tower still. <laughs> Boy's not right. No. Well, I'll tell you what, let's let him ring. I'll conclude by saying you're a very dirty guy. Appreciate all your help today. One dirty bell maker. You give your dad and your brother our, uh, our best. Our okay? best. Appreciate it. You got dirty quite a bit yourself. <laughs> I'm going back in the church for a quiet moment. See you, Bill. Take care, Mike. Sometimes people stop me on the streets and they say, Mike, we know you're looking for dirty jobs, but what exactly qualifies as a dirty job? And I say, well, just about everything. Uh, cleaning up dead pigeons, it's a dirty job. Uh, cleaning up uh, pigeon poo, uh, it's a dirty job. Cleaning pigeon poo off a 150-year-old bell, very, very dirty job. Get the idea? If you've got one, discovery.com forward slash dirty jobs. Give us a call. We'll come out and ring your bell. It's a very dirty, dirty job. The cameramen have gone above and beyond the call of duty. Not that we actually have a call of duty, but if we did, we'd be beyond it. Now I'm safe. Doug, come here a sec. You got a thing on your, what you call it? 